In his book, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, author Mark Devers writes about a conversation he once had with a friend. He says, I once had a friend who worked for a campus Christian ministry while attending a church where I was a member. He would always slip in right after the hymns, sit there for the sermon, and then leave. I asked him one day why he didn't come for the whole service. Well, he said, I don't get anything out of the rest of it. Have you ever thought about joining the church, I responded. He thought that that was just an absurd comment. He said, why would I join the church? If I joined them, I think they would just slow me down spiritually. I asked, have you ever considered that maybe God wants you to link arms with these people? And that perhaps even though they might slow you down a little, you might help to speed them up. And that that's part of God's plan about how we're supposed to live as Christians together. Now, this man's reason for not joining the church was that he felt that membership would slow him down, that somehow it would hinder his spiritual growth. Uh, But by way of contrast, consider the attitude of a young 16-year-old Charles Spurgeon and his intense longing to become a member of a local church right after he was saved. Spurgeon said this, I well remember how I joined the church after my conversion. I forced myself into it by telling the pastor who was lax and slow after I had called four or five times and could not see him that I had done my duty and if he did not see me and interview me for church membership, I would call a church meeting myself (laughs) and tell them that I believed in Christ and ask them if they would have me. (laughs) Now, how could two Christians have such differing views on church membership. One person thinks that joining a church is going to slow them down spiritually, while the other person is so determined to join the church that in the words of one writer who was familiar with Spurgeon, he said, and I quote, he was banging at the door of the church to get in. Well, the reason that these two Christians saw church membership so differently is because the first man did not understand the biblical teaching concerning church membership and how membership could actually help his spiritual growth. It definitely would not slow him down. While Spurgeon, even as a young teenager, a new convert to Christ, he knew that scripture taught that he needed pastoral oversight to help him to grow spiritually and that that he should commit himself to a local body of believers and that church membership was the God-ordained way for both of these things to be accomplished. Now, if you were here last week, then you know that today we are continuing our brief study of what the Bible has to say concerning being a member in a local church. As I told you last Sunday, the reason that I want to study this particular subject on church membership is because it recently came to my attention that only half of the people who attend Lakeside are members and the other half are not. Now, I'm sure that those who are not members have their own reasons for this. I suggested last week a few reasons why this might be the case. But I want to add one more reason this morning that some of you might not be members of Lakeside. As a result of last week's sermon, it has come to my attention that some people assumed that they were already considered members of Lakeside because their names are listed in the church directory. But that's not the case. You see, Lakeside's directory is simply a list of every individual who identifies Lakeside as the church that they go to. That's all. It includes members and non-members. So the fact that your name is in the church directory does not mean that you are a member of this church. You are only an official member of Lakeside if you have gone through the process of attending the membership classes and then have been approved for membership by the elders of the church, and then have been officially and publicly recognized as members. But regardless, regardless of the reason someone might have for choosing to attend Lakeside and not be a member of the church, I find that one half of the congregation being non-members, I find it alarming and frankly an unhealthy church situation, and one that I feel prompted by the Lord to address. 
And so last week in my annual, my annual State of the Church Address, which is always subtitled, What I Would Like to See at Lakeside in the Coming Year, I started to address the issue of church membership by posing two questions. Question number one, is church membership biblical? I mean, is it even biblical? And we concluded that it was, based on the wording given in Acts chapter 5, that those who belonged to the church at Jerusalem joined the church. Joined the church. That's a very important point. It was a formal type joining, not an assumed type of relationship. Secondly, the fact that certain scriptures would not make any sense apart from a well-defined church membership, we can conclude that the Bible indeed teaches, the New Testament teaches, church membership is biblical. It's expected of all believers in Christ, and it is therefore an issue of obedience to Christ. Second question I posed last Sunday was, why is church membership important? With the most obvious reason being that if it's taught in the Bible, and it is, then it is a matter of obedience to Christ. But in addition, I, I gave you three practical reasons why membership in a local church is important. Number one, because it is only through church membership that you can receive the kind of pastoral shepherding that helps you grow spiritually and protects you from sinful behavior and false teaching. You see, just sitting in this church and hearing sermons from this pulpit, that's not enough for your spiritual growth. Because without membership, you have no accountability to the leaders, to the elders of this church. And that means that no elder then has any authority over you to give you counsel, to give you direction. You don't have to listen to them. You've never agreed to submit to the elders. And without accountability to your pastors, you have limited their ability to shepherd you properly, and therefore you have put yourself in a very dangerous spiritual place. Dangerous place spiritually. Second reason church membership is important is because it's only when you join a church that you'll be able to use your spiritual gifts properly to serve others in the church. At Lakeside, as I told you last week, we do not allow non-members to do any ministry that involves teaching or handling the word. In addition, there are a number of ministries that require church membership at Lakeside. And so to not be a member means that you are not able to function in the body of Christ the way that God designed you to function by giving you these gifts in the first place. Third reason church membership is important is because it helps you to have assurance of your salvation. Because not only does membership in the church identify you as a believer in Christ, but how you respond to other members in the church who confront you when you have strayed from obeying biblical truth, that does reveal your spiritual condition, your heart. Those who are converted when confronted, they repent of their sin. Those who are unconverted continue to sin. They're eventually publicly disciplined, and they never repent, thus revealing that they were never truly saved. Now today, I, I want to continue this, and I want to move on by asking you a third and final question concerning church membership, and then we will observe the Lord's Supper. The third question is this, what are the responsibilities of church members? If one is to become a member of this church, or for that matter, any evangelical local church, then it's important to know what is expected of you. In other words, what will you be called upon to do if you join the church. So here are some of the responsibilities involved in being a member of Lakeside. First of all, you will be expected to be involved in the lives of other members. Not in an intrusive, meddling, pushy kind of way. We're not talking about that. But rather in a loving way that serves and benefits them. The New Testament letters, of which I might add the majority are addressed to churches, are filled with exhortations about our responsibilities towards one another, towards other believers in the context of the local church. The only possible way that you can fulfill such responsibilities is by being active members of a local church, vitally involved in the lives of other 
members of that church. Many of these New Testament responsibilities are expressed in what has been commonly referred to as the one another passages of the New Testament, the one another commands, because these are commands on how we are to relate and treat one another. So they're called one another passages. There are actually 58 of them. 58 of these one another commands found in the New Testament. I'll not mention all of them, but I do want to just touch, just read to you just a few of them. John chapter 13, we are commanded to love one another. Galatians 5.13 tells us to serve one another. Romans 12.10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Romans 12.16, be of the same mind toward one another. Galatians 6, 1, brethren, even if, any, uh, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness or gentleness. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens. Hebrews 10, 24, stimulate one another to love and good deeds. <coughs> 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, encourage one another and build up one another. Ephesians 521, be subject to one another. And, and there are many other one another passages just like these in the New Testament. This is just a sampling, but I think you get the point. See, the only way, the only way that you can fully fulfill these commands, and I would add they are commands, these are not suggestions. These are commands from God. The only way you can fulfill these commands is by being committed to a local body of believers, and that commitment is expressed when you choose to become a member of that church. In fact, the only possible way that you can obey these commands is by having ongoing relationships with a group of believers by means of church membership, because it's in church membership that you are officially and visibly committing yourself to them. Concerning this type of commitment to fulfill these one another responsibilities towards other believers, towards other members, Wayne Mack in his book, interestingly entitled, To Be or Not to Be a Church Member, that is the question, he writes this, it's impossible for any believer to fulfill these biblical responsibilities to other believers without some kind of formal, regular, continuous relationship. That kind of relationship is provided by church membership. By formally identifying with a specific group of people, we're able to commit our time and resources to developing close relationships with those people. We're able to meet with those people on a regular basis and depend on their continued involvement in our lives. So to be a member of Lakeside then involves that you are involved in the lives of other members. But not as I said earlier, and I repeat, not in the sense of you're, you're pushing your way into their lives, they don't want you, but you're pushing your way, you're intruding. No, but rather by serving them, praying for them, loving them in tangible ways, rejoicing with them, crying with them, encouraging them, coming alongside of them and helping to bear their burdens. That's what the Bible is talking about. Listen, this is the kind of life that every every Christian is called to. It is not an option in our lives. You can't say, well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not socially comfortable with other people, so I'm exempt from that. No, not at all. According to the New Testament, when you were converted, you became a part of God's family so that you now have brothers and sisters in Christ, and you are to treat them as brothers and sisters in Christ, by actively being involved in their lives in a manner that promotes their godliness. Anything other than that, it's just abnormal. It's sinful. It's not right. Folks, this is why it's so important to understand that when the Bible speaks of being a member in a local church, it's not talking about simply having your name listed on a membership role, and there's nothing beyond that. Now, there are some churches like that 
who just want your name on their membership role. They promote membership for the sake of padding their numbers so that they can boast of their high membership statistics. It, it's churches where they might have, let's say, um, 2,000 members listed, but only 1,000 people are, even are there. The other 1,000 are going to another church or they're dead, but they're still listed as members. We all know churches like that. I mean, maybe not all of us. I know churches like that. Some of them are in heaven, but they're listed as members. Listen, at Lakeside, we don't do that. Because according to Scripture, membership in a church means active membership. Where members are active, they're involved in serving one another. And the New Testament knows no such thing as someone who is a member of a church in name only, but not actively involved in functioning as a member. I know that's part of our culture. That's not what the New Testament teaches, and that's what we're committed to. Second, biblical responsibility, in addition to being involved in the lives of other believers, a second biblical responsibility of church members is to be in a proper relationship with the elders of that church. This is a two-way street. The elders are to treat church members properly, and the members are to respond to the elders properly. The New Testament has a great deal to say about the relationship between the elders of a church and the members of the church, the flock. For example, we read in 1 Peter 5, I read this earlier, but I'll read chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 again. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that's to be revealed, shepherd the church or the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Now, according to these verses, elders are to shepherd the flock and to exercise oversight of the church, but they are to do this with the right attitudes, the right motivations, the right treatment of the people. First, Peter says they are not to shepherd them by compulsion, meaning that they're not to say, oh, nobody will do it, so I guess I have to, or feeling forced to do it, but rather, Peter says, with a willing heart, because they know that they were called by God to do this, and so it's a matter of obedience to the Lord, and they desire to do this. Second, they are not to shepherd the members of the church in order to take financial advantage over them. In other words, they are not to do the work of a pastor in order to use their position and their influence to make money by exploiting the people of their wealth. Third, they are not to lord it over the members of the church, meaning that pastors are not to dominate the people of the church in a dictatorial way. They are not to use their positions of authority to manipulate or intimidate anyone. Now, I think this is a very important issue, and it's one that is quite relevant. I know that there are pastors who do act like dictators, act like tyrants over the people in their church. And some of you may have come from churches where the pastor did lord it over you, and you were spiritually abused. And perhaps this is why you might be hesitant to join Lakeside and put yourself under the authority of its elders because you fear being spiritually abused again. I understand that. But let me say, Lakeside is not your old church. And our elders are not dictators. They are men of God with a proven track record. Years of ministering. Some of them many years of ministering. They're here to serve you, not control you. Nobody wants to control you. They want to serve you. Leaders of cults control their members, but not true shepherds. Speaking for all of the elders, I want you to know that our commitment to you is that we will not ever mistreat you spiritually. We love you, but we are committed to shepherd you by teaching you God's word with love and humility, and as Peter says, by being examples to you. We want to teach the word. We want to live out the word before you. That, that's all. We're here to serve you. Now, this is how elders are to, to be responsible 
to treat the members of the church. But the New Testament also speaks of the responsibilities that members of the church have towards its leaders. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, say this, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Now, according to Paul, members of the church are to appreciate and to hold their elders in high esteem and love, not because they might personally like them or they might be close friends with an elder or or two. That's not the reason. But solely because of the work they do for the members of the church. And what work is that? Paul said they instruct you in the word of God. That's why you ought to appreciate them. That's why you ought to esteem them highly in love. Listen, members of a church are not to be in rebellion towards their leaders. They are not to resist their efforts to shepherd them. Instead, they are to submit to their elders. And that's why Paul adds adds at the end of verse 13, live in peace with one another. Why does he say that? Because when elders treat the flock properly and the flock responds properly back to the elders, then there's peace. There's not war. So elders of the church are responsible to lead you in a godly manner, and members of the church are responsible to let elders lead them by submitting to them. This is why, and we've said this before, Hebrews 13, 17 is such an important verse. It states, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. There is nothing that grieves a pastor more than a rebellious church member who refuses to submit to their biblical authority and fights and argues with issues over them, over them with, with issues. There's nothing more spiritually unprofitable, the writer to the Hebrews says, for you as a church member if you are the one fighting and arguing with the elders. So according to the New Testament, church members are responsible to be actively involved in each other's lives. That's the standard of Scripture. And in addition, they are to be in a proper relationship with the elders of the church. But there is a third biblical responsibility that members have that I want to bring to your attention. Members are to support the church by their financial giving and faithful attendance. Now, before I address these issues, I do want to say that I I know, I'm aware that many of you who are not members of this church do support Lakeside with your very generous financial contributions. And I know that you support Lakeside by your faithful attendance. And I want to say publicly, I appreciate that. But there are some people in attendance this morning who may be considering church membership and they need to know what is entailed in their responsibilities of giving and attendance. So, first of all, those who are members of the church, they do have the responsibility of financially supporting the church. There is no outside source that gives to Lakeside. It's up to the Lord working through you as members to support this ministry. The Apostle Paul set the the pattern for financial giving by church members when when he wrote to the Corinthians and said in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2, note this because this is the pattern for New Testament church giving. I might say before I even read this, it's not tithing. Tithing is an Old Testament law. We're not under the law. Tithing was really a tax. Giving through the church, to the church, the Lord through the church. It's a love offering. In fact, and you can listen to messages on this and on the time to deal with this now, but you can listen to those messages that explain that if you were to really follow the letter of the law of the Old Testament and you insist, I must tithe, it's closer to 30% than 10%. There were three tithes. So I just want to say that the New Testament does not teach tithing, It teaches grace giving. 
And here's what we read. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of, of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. Now notice what the Apostle Paul said concerning giving. First of all, he said that giving is to take place each Sunday. That's the, this is the first day of the week, Sunday. When the church gathers, you take an offering. That's what he said. Secondly, he said that it's for every one, each one of you. There are no exceptions. Each one of you. If you're a member of the church, if you're a believer, you're to give. Third, he said that the amount that each member is to give is to be determined based, as I said, it's not a tithe, but based on how God has prospered them. In other words, the more that the Lord prospers you financially, the more you should give. The less he prospers you, the less you should give. So if you get a raise, you give more. If your pay is cut, you give less. Now how do you determine how much to give? Well, you look at other passages of Scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, it talks about as everyone is purposed in his heart. You pray about it. You're, you're guided by the principle of generosity and being sacrificial, and you pray and ask the Lord to give you wisdom. And then you give with joy in your heart. It's based upon you. This is how a church is to be supported. It's by, as I said, the members give each week their financial contributions. As I said, there, we have no outside source that gives money to this church. God has designed local churches to be sustained solely by the faithful giving of its members. Secondly, faithful attendance is also a responsibility of the members of the church, and the classic passage on faithful church attendance is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, where here's what we read. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now what the writer is telling these people is that in light of the persecution, these were Hebrews being persecuted, in light of the persecution, in light of the trials that they were facing, they needed one another. And they needed to know that they needed one another. And what they specifically needed each other for was encouragement. They were to encourage one another to be loving and to do deeds of kindness. In other words, as difficult as life was for them, with all the persecution and trials, they were still to urge one another to keep a sweet spirit and to do deeds of kindness, not grow bitter, not walk away from church, not get a, a grudge and, and a hardened heart. The way that the writer says that we make sure that we do this, that we stimulate one another to love and good deeds in spite of all the battles we're facing, the way we do this is we gather together on Sundays in church. You see, we need this time together with our brothers and sisters so that we can interact with them for the purpose of urging them to love others and do good deeds. It isn't just about listening to a sermon and then leaving. It's about interacting. It's, that's why it's important to be a part of a, of a Sunday school class. You interact, you talk. You, you urge one another to press on in light of the personal battles that you're going through. Listen, coming to church on Sundays, it isn't merely about you. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that, but I am now. It's not merely about you and what you can get out of the service. It's about coming in order to serve others. Being there for them, by encouraging them in the struggles and discouragements of life. They need you. You need them. In addition, gathering on Sundays is also the one time, the one time during the week when we worship together. And it is so meaningful because not only does it delight the Lord to hear the praises of his people as we gather and, and those praises ascend to him, but it's also a time when we teach one another. We admonish one another biblical truths in our singing. I don't know if you've ever really thought about that, but listen to what Paul taught the 
Colossians. Colossians 3, verse 16. He said, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. That is, saturate yourself with Scripture, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, note this, one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, according to Paul, when we sing together in our church meetings, we are teaching one another. We are admonishing one another. That's why it's very important that that Joel picks out biblically sound songs. Songs that not only have a, a good tune, but they also have the right lyrics. Because when we sing those songs, we're... We're affirming that we believe these truths. We're teaching it to one another. We're saying, yes, we believe this. That's why it's important. By your presence here on Sunday, you are involved in teaching others biblical doctrine by your singing. So, this is my State of the Church address to you. It took a little more than a week, but it's my address to you. And what would I like to see at Lakeside in the year 2020? What I'd like to see is for many of you who have not been members of Lakeside to become members because you are convinced before God that this is the biblically right thing to do. And you're going to have the opportunity to do this. Jack earlier announced that we are having membership classes starting February 16th. They are four weeks They meet at 9 a.m. in the church library. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. That's my desire, that you sign up, that you be a member, and do all that the New Testament says you're to do in that setting. Now, one final word is in order concerning faithful attendance at church meetings, and that is that all members should make sure that they participate in the Lord's Supper. Not just when we have it Sunday mornings, when you're here, but Sunday nights when you might not be here. It's important that you participate in the Lord's Supper, morning or evening. We switch off every month because the Lord's Supper is the time that we gather as members of the body of Christ to not only remember our Lord's death for us, that's what Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's also a time for us to check our hearts, to make sure that we have not sinned against others in the body of Christ. So we examine ourselves. Do we have grudges? Have we forgiven one another? Have we been angry at each other? All, all of that, have we been, all, all, any of these sins that we've demonstrated, they need to be repented of and perhaps need to go to people and ask their forgiveness. Here's what the Apostle Paul taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting in verse 23, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. That means examine yourself and confess, repent of sin. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So, let's look to the Lord now, and then the men who are sitting up front are going to pass out the elements to you. This is just for believers. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, let the elements pass you by. It's just for believers, and it's just for believers who are obeying the Lord. If you're in sin and refuse to repent, then I urge you, repent, and then take the Lord's Supper. If not, let it pass you by. Father, we thank you. We thank you that no one can come to you unless you grant that they come to you. And Lord, I recognize there are many here who, as we've said, 
who are members of your body, but not members of this local church. I pray that what's been said last week and this week will move them to do what's right, to become a member, to function properly. Lord, I pray for the health of our church. I pray, Lord, that you would um, do a mighty work here, that we would be honoring to you, pleasing to you. But now as we partake of your supper, help us to remember you, Lord, to focus on you. We thank you for dying for our sins. We thank you for granting us eternal life. And we pray that taking the elements will be very meaningful. If there is indeed uh, sinful attitudes that we have towards one another, I pray that you'll help us to know what these are, that you'll bring it to our minds, and that we would repent and confess our sins. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.